One more for you. This one is called Marooned. Overdue at a friend's house for dinner, I parked the minivan in the garage and urged my daughters to get out of the car and into the house where my wife and the babysitter were waiting. I reached into the back seat to help my six-year-old Gracie expedite her exit, which is when she hit me in the face with the beads. These purple and gold Mardi Gras beads were just some of the plastic detritus that collects in the home of any family with small children, petrochemical dust bunnies that accumulate via happy meals and wishes granted by the cut-rate fairies my children find under rocks. Wherever they come from, they really hurt when they struck me across the bridge of my nose. I took the beads from Gracie. Say goodbye, I said, and then, my friends, I turned and hurled those beads as far as I could. In the moment it took for the beads to arc through the air up into the roof of our neighbor's garage across the alley, they transformed from a worthless plastic gim crack into my daughter's most prized possession, <laughs> a priceless heirloom handed down through generations of hysterically overdramatic little girls. <laughs> Gracie howled as if I had just taken her to a kennel, allowed her to pick out a puppy, and then stabbed it. <laughs> Her eight-year-old sister, Rosie, who is happy, whose hobby is acting out tragic Italianate operas of her own devising, clutched her notional bosom and wailed, and both girls ran screaming into the house ahead of me. When I came in, the babysitter was seated in the kitchen, glazed shock on her face. In the living room, my wife, Beth, embraced a weeping Rosie and Gracie, who told them between sobs of what I had done with their very favorite beads they loved so very, very much. He, he threw them! They're on the roof! They're on the roof! My wife looked at me with a merciless disdain. I'm sure he feels very bad about it, she said. I decided to be a man about it. That is, I decided to correct the situation without ever admitting I had committed an error. I went down to the basement, retrieved our ladder, and passed the still goggling babysitter on the way out the door. When this old world starts getting you down, and people are just too much for me to take up on the roof. The ladder came up to about three feet below the lip of the roof of the neighbor's garage. I easily hoisted myself up and retrieved the holy beads of Turin. Then I tried to come down, but seated on the edge of the roof, my dangling legs hung a good foot above the very top of the ladder. To get back onto the ladder, I'd have to slide off the roof, fall for a foot, hit the three-inch wide top of the ladder, and hope that it wouldn't topple over. I stood up and went to each side of the garage roof to look for the pile of garbage bags filled with K-pop that are always below any high precipice supporting a hero. No dice. There was a tree growing next to the garage. Sometimes, heroes jump from high places onto trees, which bend willingly, and thus the heroes are able to descend to the ground. This tree looked prickly and sharp, and just as high, frankly, as the roof. It began to occur to me that I wasn't the hero. Up on the roof, up on the roof. I considered calling for help. If my wife and children came out along with the babysitter, any anger they felt would be immediately washed away by the flood of laughter and joy expressed by my humiliating plight. Papa's on the roof, Gracie would shout and clap her little hands together, and all would beam and grin until darkness inexorably fell. Or a neighbor answers my call, perhaps even the neighbor who owned the garage. After hearing my abashed explanation, the neighbor would produce a taller ladder, and I would descend, and news of the incident would spread like ragweed throughout the neighborhood, and parents would jokingly tell their children to keep their fake plastic jewelry away from Mr. Sagal. <laughs> and contemplating that, I realized that I would quite literally rather die, <laughs> which is a striking thought to have in a moment when you are standing on a roof. Up on the roof. The public humiliation scenario was becoming more and more likely as I stood there visible for miles, the figurehead of the USS Moron. <laughs> I sat down on the edge of the roof and holding my breath, pushed off into space. My feet hit the ladder. It wobbled but did not fall. I climbed down, folded up the ladder, and walked inside. The girls were still sobbing. 
I handed Gracie the beads. There, I said. She sniffled, but kept crying. How did you get them? She asked. I climbed up and got them, okay? I'm sorry I threw them on the roof, but you shouldn't have hit me with them. Beth and I walked out the door to go to our friend's house. As we left, I noticed that the beads had been dropped into a corner of the sofa. They remained there for two months until Beth found them while cleaning and threw them out. <laughs> sorry, I said to the babysitter. It happens, she said. Does it? On the drive over to our friend's house, I kept scanning the roof lines, looking for rage-crazed dads, <laughs> holding plastic toys, looking for a way down. Up on the roof. Thank you so much. Peter Sagal, ladies and gentlemen. Flux, do I have that right? That's, that's where pirates dress up in skin-tight outfits. Okay, somebody give me a give me a shout out for. Yeah. So I just want to say before I uh, give up the stage that uh, I am extraordinarily grateful to be here. That you guys uh, are terrific. That this cruise has been much more fun than I ever thought it could be. Like a lot of you. I'm sure you're like, Is this going to be fun? Yes. And I just want to express my gratitude to Paul and Storm, who did so much to organize this, and of course to Jonathan Colton, who is one of those people who gathers around him in his gravitational field. Really cool people. He is a nerdy son, and I am happy, happy to be one of his satellites. Good night, everybody, and thank you.